All right, the book of Romans. We've been Roman through Romans. Amen. I really have been enjoying it. I probably taught it many times. I don't know. I count, haven't counted. But it's like anything else. You learn more as you go, right? And you delve into it. And the picture becomes clearer as you get older in the Lord. You begin to see things more clear. And the only way I know, there's an old song that the Bill Gaither trio used to do, and it was called New Point of View. And it talks about taking in, getting into a balloon and going up and seeing the same area from a different height. And I think a lot of times as we grow in the Lord, our eyes are open, we see the things of the Lord, and the scripture opens more to us. Like you were saying, Peggy, the other day, that I, I can read same scripture, but I get just more out of it. That's exactly what. It's kind of like the scripture becomes 3D, you know. All right, the book of Romans, we're in chapter 9. So follow along as we read the heading of the verse, plus the answers are there too. And it says, uh, it's good to have you tonight, amen. And we've been reading and teaching on the book of Romans, and tonight is Romans chapter 9. So let's review. We have it in there. And you say, well, it's in there a lot. Well, be before we're done, somebody will ask you, well, what's the book of Romans about? And you'll be able to say chapter 1 is about, chapter 2 is about. You got it? You'll at least have that much knowledge, at least to, to be close enough. Can you say amen? So some of you, let's do it with our eyes closed. And I'll read it out to you. And if you don't want to, just read it off the page. All right, chapter one, what's it about? What happens when humans reject God? Absolutely. Chapter two. About religious, religious people judging others? Yes, it's about religious people looking down their noses and judging others and then practicing the same things because of sin. And then it moves us to chapter 3, which tells us exactly what the problem is. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. That moves us into chapter 4, which tells us there's a way out through faith, right? And see, we see a little glimpse of faith before the law and in David, faith after the law. So chapter 4 is just that thing. It's how by believing in God, faith, by faith, it makes us righteous even before the law in Abraham and after in David. In chapter 5, what's that about? Sin entered mankind. Sin entered mankind. Let's, let's do something here. We'll stop here for a second. Um... What was it like? It was kind of like when sin came in, it was kind of like catching a terminal disease. We were injected with some kind of, well, we injected ourselves with some kind of terminal disease. And the only cure is who? Jesus. So chapter 5 is how that one, one man's sin, death entered us, and the vaccination and cure all is the one man's act of righteousness through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now it's neat because I was probably saved a year before I realized that Jesus is called the last Adam to tell us that Jesus fixed the problem of the first Adam. Can you say amen? All right, so, okay, moves us to chapter six. What's chapter six about? We are dead to sin but alive in God through Christ. The greater, that's called the great what? Exchange. exchange. God exchanged himself for us and we exchanged ourselves for him. And we did that by surrendering and asking God to help come into our lives, right? Okay, and then chapter seven, what's that about? Right, the Jews were married to the law. In fact, tonight when we look at chapter 9, you can hear Paul's heart because he was a Pharisee at one time. He was raised and trained all his life. So when he got saved, it was like a divorce. 
So he still longs for his brethren to be saved. So we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyway, so then we move to chapter 7. So the Jews were married to the law, but they found that they can be free in Christ. Then chapter 8. We had to break it into two. Anybody want to tell me what 8 was about? The freedom that's in Christ and the victory we have by walking with him. See, many Christians, I think what happens is they get saved and, and they love God. They sit down. They don't walk with him. They sit down, really. <laughs> they don't sit down in God and then walk with him. They, they sit down. <laughs> in other words, they sat and, and so God can't get any growth in them because it's what we do in faith is how God exercises God in us, right? Doesn't it come in like a seed? Isn't he perfect? Isn't he absolutely perfect? But he doesn't germinate and grow in us to the degree of unless we apply the word by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. All right, so let's go on. So chapter 8, freedom. That's in Christ Jesus, all right? Not only that, but we are adopted sons and daughters of God, of the king, right? God is now working out the flaws inside of us. Now, here's what happens, and it breaks my heart. God will work out the flaws, however fast, listen closely, or slow that you want to work with him, right? How many know that some people can work really slow with God? Which means that basically either they're resisting him when they don't know they are or they're stubborn don't, or doing their own thing a way that seems right to a man or they just don't know what to do. So all of a sudden it's slower for them to grow. Then you get somebody like you guys. You can't get enough of the word. You want to grow fast so God has something to work with, right? So we're growing up out of ourselves, are we not? So here's what happens. As you grow up out of yourself, you run into yourself. As you're growing up out of yourself, there's little blockages of yourself that rises up their head. These are the imaginations and the strongholds we cast down. So as you're growing in the word... You're going to come up to an issue and God's going to say, okay, you and I are going to deal with that. What do you mean? You, you want to deal with my, my mouth? <laughs> he says, it won't be bad. I'll teach you how to talk. Because your mouth has been getting you into trouble. And God will work with us, right? Now, what would happen if I refused to allow God to work with me? I stopped growing right at that point. And most Christians don't know that. Then they have to justify not growing. So what's the next step they take? Unknowingly most of the time, they have to find a fault with the person that challenged them. I don't like the way you sniffle when you preach. Whatever, you know. You see how it works? Satan's a master at deceiving. He moves the person out of the spirit into the flesh, right? Because the flesh always notices the faults of others, but never notices their own. Look at your neighbor and say, he's preaching real good right about now. All right, so I want to move, move off of that. But as we grow in the Lord, that's what happens. You're developing, Christ is developing on the inside. You're changing like a butterfly. And you're coming now up to the wall of your cocoon. And your cocoon has a mind of its own. And it says, I'm not budging, boo-boo. Isn't making sense. I'm trying to make humorous of it. And instead of Because it gets tight when I come to that. So what happens? They get mad. I'm not going to do it. You get mad. And then they leave. Think about it. How can a person get mad over something so stupid and throw everybody they love away. Now, is that love? Let's move right on. Okay, so let's look at this. My point in chapter 9. Listen, the point, right under the point there. Now, here in chapter 9, we will see Israel's rejection of Christ. Can you imagine that? 
which serve God's purpose. Remember what Jesus did in 13th chapter of Matthew. He was ministering to the Jewish people, right? To the Jew first, then to the Greek. So he was ministering, but what did the Jews do? They turned their back on Jesus. So we see him in chapter 13 of Matthew that he left the house of Israel and went to the sea of the Gentiles. Same thing Paul is discussing, how his heart is breaking because they're going to reject Jesus Christ and, and, and it's going to serve God's purpose because when they shut their eyes off of the Christ, he will go to the rest of the people. God's obligated to appeal to his nation first as his promise to Abraham. And if they reject him, guess where he's going? To anyone that will listen. That means the rest of us Gentiles. So Israel's rejection and their stubbornness of Jesus opened the door wide open for Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. And so he writes about it and he says, now, it goes on. And he's also going to touch base. God's going to use the seed of Abraham to bless the world, correct? But do you know that Abraham more, had more than one seed of promise? He had Ishmael, didn't he? Yeah. Okay. So, so the point I'm trying to make is there's an Ishmael and there's an Isaac. Symbol of flesh and spirit. Symbol of Cain and Abel. Remember, this pattern's all through the Bible. It never changes because these are the basic, uncorruptible truths. Okay? Now, we read this. So God, for what purpose did God raise up Egypt? Well, we remember the story of Joseph, right? And ended up, after all the corruption, Satan using his brothers to throw them in, in to sell them finally to slavery, went into, you know, Egypt, right? And then gets arrested. Pharaoh's, you know, because of the whatever, I forget what his name was. But anyway, you know, her, his wife, she was a floozy in the Bible's written. And she started coming on to uh, Joseph. And Joseph wouldn't have it. So she narked on him anyway. They threw him in jail. I don't know how many years. What, 17? Seven? I, I don't know. But when he did, he had visions and everything. We know he ended up, I'm just going to make a long story short. He ended up at the right hand of Pharaoh. Right? And through that, saved Israel because there was a famine. Brought Israel came in, he fed them. You know, he, he just worked the land, right? So the Israelites stayed. And in Egypt, they got stronger. And they were there how many years? Can you remember? I think it's 400 years. 400 years in Egypt bondage. Okay. They got huge. They grew, prospered. And now the next pharaohs didn't like him so well. And so he even mentions this when we read it. That God raised up Egypt to pamper the Israelites and then raised them up to prove his power and his glory when he swallowed them up in the Red Sea. Are you with me? Yeah. So I'm just giving you the heads up of this chapter, okay? It's right there in your point notes, anyway. So throughout history, Israel tried to follow God by works, right? So Israel's fleshliness and pride quickened God's plan for us, the Gentiles. God resists the what? The proud and gives grace to the... Okay, so here's a prelude. Now, you got Romans, right? I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12, to give you a prelude to what he's talking about in Romans. Now, let me ask you something. God loved Israel, right? Okay, now, when Israel was first given, the name Israel was given to whom? Jacob. And what did he have to do to get his name changed? He had to wrestle with the angel of the Lord, who was 
Jesus. Remember the angel of the Lord, Old Testament is, is Christ. Okay, before he becomes a Christ. Okay, so, and, and he changed his name. You got to bless me. He said, bless me. And what? God changed his name, symbolizing when you get saved, your name changes from going to hell name to going to heaven. Can you say amen? Your character changes. Your nature changes. And so that's what Israel is a symbol of a person in faith that believes in God, Jacob. And God even raised up, he's going to mention that, he raised up to bless Jacob. And Jacob, he turned Jacob around, so he blessed the younger instead of the latter. It was what? Yeah. All right. So he used all of that to work his plan. So what was the plan? Remember, God needed to get a Messiah into the earth to rescue his children. So that plan started right at the very fall of man. And God had to work with fallen man to get his covenants in here so he could get halfway in himself and start working side by side by man. That's why the Holy Spirit was very limited in the Old Testament. He's unlimited in the New but the old, he was limited on the prophet, the priest, and the king. You got to go find a prophet. And then if the prophet's crabby, you got to wait till he wants to speak. You know, wow. You know, you don't have this insta prophet, you know, hit the button like we do nowadays. Hey, I'll prophesy over you. Please don't. Anyway, so you ready? First Corinthians 10, listen to this. Paul is writing this, and he's writing this because. He was a Pharisee. He learned this from synagogue. He learned the troubles of Moses and the Israelites through the wilderness from the synagogue. But then God retaught him how God felt about it. And he writes it as God tells him how he feels about it. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware, polite word for ignorant, that all our forefathers... We're under the cloud and all pass through the sea. Do you guys know what the cloud means? The cloud. Remember, the Israelites went through the wilderness and during the day get hot. So a cloud would cover them. Who was that cloud? It was Jesus. Or God, if you want to call him that. Right? Who turned to a fire by night. Right? So the cloud was amazing because... The clouds shadowed them, but they still got sun. It filtered out the harmful rays. Yes. But it also shielded them from the Egyptians seeing them. Think about how that works in the New Testament. God covers you so Satan can't see you. Amen. Right? And he keeps the sun and the elements of the earth from burning you to death. Hello? A type of Christ. Everything in the Old Testament, some way, some shape, some form, a type of Christ. So it goes, and you were under the cloud and all passed through the what? Sea. Sea is important because the Red Sea closed on Pharaoh. But what really what he's saying there is the Red Sea separated them from the worldly Egypt. And now they and God were on their own. That's exactly what happened to you and I. When we got born again, God separated you. You passed through the Red Sea. What do you mean? You went into Christ. Hello. You were separated from the world at that moment. Now, if you don't do something, get in the word, some older Christian starts pointing you in the right direction, you're going to flounder about and your growth's going to be slow. And then one day you'll find a church like this where your growth speeds up. And then one day you're going to face yourself. And you're going to try to want to rip that cocoon away. And you're going to do one or two things. You're either going to back off and stay a baby all your life. Or you're going to have to kick your way out of that cocoon. Because that's really your old way of living. The way the old way you used to do stuff. Your old way of patterns and habits. And you're going to have to kick it loose. But you don't have to kick by yourself. Jesus is right in there helping you kick. 
Why is it we look at a project and we go, oh my gosh. We don't look at that the way God wants it. When little David saw Goliath, he didn't go, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? No. God will do that. If you're willing, God will just get on you and just anoint you. Amen, somebody. Amen. So, okay, listen to what he says. They all passed through the Red Sea, separated. All were baptized into Moses. It means all placed into Moses' direction and leadership. Remember the law was given through the hands of a mediator, Moses? Okay, all right. So being baptized into Moses doesn't mean that Moses is their savior per se, but he's their leader anointed by God. So they're immersed into what Moses tells them to do. That's why I want you to understand. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Okay. And he says, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. What kind of food came down? Manna. Manna a type of Christ. Amen. All right. And they all drank from the same spiritual drink. What drink was that? The drink is... The water that came out of the rock, remember? Yeah. Who's the rock? Jesus. Jesus. You only smite the rock once. Moses got in big trouble when he smote it again. Amen. Here's what, that's what happens when somebody says, Jesus, you got to bless me. And they're asking with all sheepiness. It's like striking them again. No, Jesus, I receive all the blessings you have for me and get me out of the way so I can get them. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Start having a fit and praising the Lord. Yeah. All right. Then it goes on. Look what it says. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Notice the rock followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most. Notice it didn't say a few. Just a couple. It says with what? Most of them God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Folks, only two went in of that one generation. Huh? Joshua, Joshua and Caleb. So I would say most God wasn't well pleased. Why? They were trying to serve God, bribery, pride. They actually had, now please, it sounds like I'm picking on them, but I'm not. But they had no born again experience. They didn't have God working on them. So whenever God moved away, they turned into the animal that, that they were trained to be, the sinful person. Hello? So God would have to show up, straighten it out. Then God would back off because of sin, and they corrupt again. I asked God, I said, why are they keep messing up? He says, because messing up was in their DNA. Have you ever noticed, probably in your childhood, there was always somebody in your clan, in your clique at high school or whatever, that always messed up and always got everybody else in trouble? Maybe you were that one. I don't know. But you can imagine, okay? So here we, here we look at this. This is so fun. So with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Satan was there. He was har harassing them every day. They were supposed to stay together. They were supposed to search the scripture. They were supposed to quote the Torah to keep them from thinking about all the other distractions. But no. Then verse, look what it said, verse 6. Now these things became our examples. Hey, we don't have to do those things. They did him. We saw what happened to him. Huh? To, to, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. We immediately think evil things is something terrible. Well, it could have been just being an idol worshiper. Doesn't matter. And do not become Id idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink. Remember I said earlier, they just sat down? 
They didn't bother to sit down in Christ and walk with him. They just sat down like a mugwomp, okay, and rose up to play. I'm going to sit down and be stubborn, but when I see something I want to do, I'm going to play with it. That's what it was. God is too hard. I'm sitting down here and, huh, I'm going to have to entertain myself. Of course, the devil's right there saying, why don't you pull out the Ouija board? You know, hello. That's how he works on kids. Anyway, let's go on. It says, <laughs> it says, nor let us commit what? Sexual immoralities. And some of them did. In one day, 23,000 fell. Whoops. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by the serpents. You know, the serpents came in, started biting them. They had to lift up Jesus on the, on the, on the pole, on the tree, right? The serpent on the pole, remember? Okay. And then it goes on. Ten. Nor complain, as some of them also <laughs> complain. Christians today, they don't complain, do they? And some of them, listen, you want to steal something? Start complaining. And here's the secret one. It doesn't matter who you complain to. You can complain to God. He'll be patient with you. Here's one that people don't know. Don't complain to somebody outside the church. Hello? Because they won't be able to give you true advice. They'll give you what they think. But here's one that's hidden. Is Let's say you work at the church and your wife doesn't work at the church. You cl complain you had to do something hard at the church, so you go home and take it to the wife. Isn't that a form of complaint that is most dangerous because it's po poisoning her opinion of the church? People do it all the time and they don't have no wisdom. Hello? And so people just assume the worst. Anyway, moving past God. So the Bible says, don't complain. And we're destroyed by the destroyer. Now let me ask you, who do you think the destroyer is? Yeah. So it says, you start complaining. Here's what happens. We move out of the spirit into the flesh. And we become easy pickings for the enemy. That's all he's saying. But in the Old Testament, they got really beat up bad. Sometimes didn't live. Hello? Remember, Satan hates everybody. Back then, they didn't have a whole lot of protection. Hello? It was so bad, God had to come down on fire in a hill for Moses, then show up in a box for the Israelites. They had to keep God in a box. But it killed everybody for miles. Now, I'm not trying to put God down at all. God asked him to do that so he didn't kill them all. So it's a world of Satan that had keep caught in a box. So they would take him out to the wilderness and they would put him in the tabernacle. They made the move, the tabernacle of David in the wilderness. And it moved as God moved and they would take the box with them. That's like taking Christ with them everywhere they went. And he would manifest in the cloud and in the fire. Now, we sure could use a little bit of that in the New Testament. You know what I mean? But here's the problem. We get a lot of people then come into the Lord because they've seen miracles like that. And they come to church. And the people at church don't know anything. Hello? And that's been a problem. We need to know stuff. Anyway, it's just a thought. It's a good one. And so, because they don't, Jehovah Witness halls are full. Mormon tabernacles are full. And you know, that's not your fault, but we need to know. May God give you the spirit of wisdom in the revelation of the knowledge of him. Amen. And that's what we're doing. We're learning. Okay, let's go on. Then he says, now all these things happened to them as examples God was teaching them. And they were written for our admonition. What's admonition? Learning. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let, uh, excuse, therefore let him who 
Think steady stands. This is a warning. Take heed that he what? Did he not fall. In other words, take a sober stance of your walk. Every day, sit down with God. First thing, have God arrange your day. Then sit down with your spouse or your partner if you have a prayer partner, if you want, and then pray. Walk with God throughout the day. Hello, are you with me? But don't take the stance that you can continue not praying and not praying with your prayer partner and not keeping prayer going, that you're going to continue in a victory because pretty soon, just the friction alone of being in this world will wear you down if you don't have a consistent prayer life and you don't have your home, your house in order. Okay, it's just one of those things. Because Satan uses the little things, doesn't he? Huh? How many times have you seen something little happen, maybe four or five times? Maybe you were at a potluck, and several little things happened. By the end of the food, you couldn't eat it because you're upset. Sometimes the little things irritate people. It's not always the big things. And so what we need to do is God help us to be sensitive that I don't say or do anything where it causes a youngin or a young believer to stumble. Can you say amen? And that will be Romans 14 when we get there. Very heavy teaching. But let's go on. So we are to take heed. What? He who thinks they stand, you are still subject to falling, aren't you? So we don't plan on it. But it happens. A couple points. Was God well pleased? Amen. So he wasn't, was he? And you know, he couldn't be because they kept giving works. They kept impressing God. What did they say to Moses before Moses went up? Do you remember, Denise? What did they say to Moses before he went up to get the Ten Commandments? You guys need to remember this stuff. Remember pride cometh before a fall? The Israelites thought that they could tell God what to do. Can you imagine the vanity in that? We be God's chosen people. What they say to Jesus? We be Abraham's seed. Heirs. You know, Jesus says, of these stones, I can raise seed to Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. You see. And so we want to go on. So, Number two, they became our examples. We should learn from others. Hello? That's why church is set up. You know, I'm not here for my good looks. I don't want to build three tabernacles. I don't want a name for myself. I just simply want to get out the gospel till my last breath. This whole entire property, I didn't have to turn it over to the ministry. I didn't have to live my entire life for others. In fact, that wasn't the thing I wanted at all. But God has different plans. And he puts the joy in doing it in your heart. And it's great joy. So finally, they became our examples. So learn to not repeat what you see as disastrous. What do we say? A person that is a complete idiot is a person that keeps doing the same thing, thinking they're going to get different results. Hello? Each time? Hello? Just leap off that building. Maybe this time you'll fly. Hello? You see, old human habit never gets anywhere. Would you? It'd be horrible if you stood before the Lord. We just learned about that. At the gate, there, standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And he tells you that two-thirds of your life, you did it for yourself to impress people. What's that mean, Jesus? That means you get nothing. So if you think about that, 
every day, think about it. You want to start doing things that God builds rewards into you. He starts putting a bank account there. Did you know you can pray faithfully in such a way it literally deposits in your spiritual bank account? So when you really need an emergency, you can pull from that because you've deposited lots of prayer already in those situations. No, we wait till the flood comes and we start praying. Or until we hit the backside of our cocoon and we start crying because we're exposed. <laughs> Boy, that must have looked good on camera, right, dear? All right, so let's go on past this. So thirdly, finally, remember, he who thinks he stands, what? Take heed. Just said take heed. In other words, pay attention that you don't fall. Okay, because people have a chance to they get a few victories and they get cocky. They get all full of themselves. And women are terrible at it because they hide it. They float around and then something automatically just falls out. And you go, why did that happen, God? You think about it. You've been strutting your pridefulness all day long, correcting everybody and telling everybody what you think. And now you're reaping a little which is sowed. No! That's what happened. So Paul is actually saying the Israelites are reaping with their soul. Let's not be like them. All right, you ready? Romans chapter 9. All right. Verse 1. Paul's grief for Israel. He says, I tell the truth in Christ I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have a great sorrow and a continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. He's talking about the Jewish people. My countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom, now listen to what he says, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternal, eternally blessed God. Amen. What did he say? His heart's breaking. Because God gave him everything. But instead of following God by faith, who was the first Israelite? Peggy. Abraham. He didn't become a Jew till 25 years later when he got circumcised. But by faith, he became a child by faith of God, believing in God, right? Right? He believed in God. It was accounted to him for righteousness sake. Now, we look at that, all right? And his heart breaks because out of Abraham, who believed in faith, came the Israelites, right? And they started believing with works. They completely turned from faith to Cain's sacrifice. And instead of preaching to the Gentile people who would come to Jerusalem to understand about God, they would preach the law to them. And they wouldn't preach the faith of the coming Messiah. Hello? No wonder God wasn't well pleased with them. So Paul says, look, my heart goes out. They were given the covenants, they were given all this, right? You with me? Of whom the fathers and from whom? According to the flesh, Christ came. What does it say, Hebrews 1, that in the volume of the book, it says that in, the, in times past, he came through the fathers and the prophets, as in these last days, he will speak to us through his son. Right? There we go. And now we're in the New Testament, right? I don't need to send for a prophet. But you'll see, some prophet will come into town and, all the people that don't read their Bible will go hoping to get a word. How silly. 
I, I did that too, so it's okay. Don't do that. Let's go on. So, Paul, point one, two, and three. Paul knew the Israelites were in the flesh, didn't he? And they rejected Christ. His heart broke. Two, they were given all they needed to follow God in the wilderness, but they didn't follow by faith, did they? Instead, perform works of the flesh. Thirdly, God was right there all the time with them, and they still missed it because they thought they had a God who served them their fleshly pride. Remember they said to Moses, you tell God we can do it. I believe, I actually believed God had a good plan, and then he had better get it together plan. Both of which were holy. Both of which were deserved. If they were good, follow God by faith, they would get instructions for their life. If you're not so good, you follow God by your works, your, your pride, you're going to get the hard circumstances of life. It's just the way it works. All right, I had to change my hands. My hands are good. You. <laughs> All right. I sure love you. Are you, you learning anything? So let's get into this now. Let's drop down to verse 6. Okay. In Romans 9 through 13. Okay. Now he says, God working his purpose through fallen man. Think about what God had to work with. People only began to call back on God and curse God in Genesis 4. So a whole bunch of people went away never to talk to God again. Nimrod and his bunch, Tower of Babel and all that, build their own city to their own God. So here it goes. But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect. Oh, the Israelites knew it. For there are not all Israel who are of Israel. Does he, do you know what he means? There's some Israelites that don't believe at all. And then some believe like the faith of Abraham. Verse 7. Nor are they all children because they are of the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your, your seed shall be called. Verse 8. That is... Those who are of the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but they are the children of the promise, excuse me, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Talking about those Isaac from Isaac. And for this, the word of promise at this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebecca also conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good nor evil, that the purposes of God was being worked according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Who calls? God. It was said to her, Rebecca. The older shall serve the younger. God told her ahead of time. Hello. And it is written, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. Okay, here we go. God, he's hating somebody. Here we go. The word hate there means disliked. Intensely disliked. Who lives in human flesh? He t intensely disliked the man. Now think about Esau for a minute. What was he notorious for? He had hairy arms. No. <laughs> he sold his birthright, didn't he? Yeah. Which means he had a beast-like nature. God had every right to give the promise to the child that will serve him by faith. Not the child that's going to represent him by works. I'm going to go out and kill a cow. I impress God. Cain and Abel. See, I'm teaching you this is going to make everything else kind of come in line. That's why you need to know truth. That's why Satan doesn't want anybody here. You follow what I'm saying? Because you get to know the key truths, and man, your own, everything explodes. That's what happened to me. 
I'm not any different. My pastor would give us key truths. Then we go, things would pop. Whoa, look, look at that. You know, and it's so fun. Because it's like God says, hey, I'll show you another thing. Oh, well, thank you, God. All right. Are you still with me? So, of whom are our fathers, okay? So, again, it says, and Rebecca, and it goes on. All right. Then, verse 12, it was said of her, the older shall serve the younger. Now, see, there's an answer why things were switched around. I gave a good one, didn't I? All right, point one, two, and three underneath that. The word was not received by the Jews, not being mixed with faith. In fact, you can find that in Hebrews chapter 4, that they wandered in the wilderness because they didn't enter the rest, because they didn't receive the word by faith. Instead, they did works and works of the flesh, which are not accepted to God. So it wasn't received by the Jews, okay? And then it goes on. Not all of Abraham's children are of the promise. Some are of the flesh, Ishmael. Some are of the promise like Isaac. Number two, the heirs of the promise are the true seed of Abraham. Jacob was chosen instead of Esau. I just told you why. The one of the promise who is Jacob, who became Israel, symbol of having his life changed. And Esau, the fleshly offspring. Nobody in the spirit is going to sell your birthright for a bunch of Wheaties. Some hot porridge would probably taste bad. Hello. Remember the people of Gideon's army? They went down the lake and was drinking or the river. Some stuck their head in the water and they were disqualified. The other was lipped up while they were looking. Listen, look around. It's not your world. Look around. See what you could do to help. You see, those are the people God wants to use. The people that are thinking of themselves, shoving their face in their food, and, and thinking of themselves, doing only what they want to do, they get overlooked. It's not that God doesn't want to use them. He just can't use flesh. Moving right along, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> And finally, third, listen, finally, thirdly, God working his plan, working it through fallen man. Wow, that must have been tough because any minute somebody could go off. Look at Samson. All right, next point. God is always just and fair in working his plan. Say amen, everybody. Even at times it doesn't seem like he is, but he is absolutely just and fair and perfect. Okay, pick up at verse 14, Romans 9. What shall we say then? Is the unrighteousness with God? Is there any unrighteousness with God? Answer, absolutely not. Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, who wants, nor of him who runs, but God who shows mercy, right? For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills. So he said, I actually had, had mercy on Pharaoh and made a very, a very powerful man. Why? He brought Joseph there, remember? But, of course, the people forgot their God and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they began killing them, right? God had to deliver the people. Amen. What's going to happen in the last days? It says about the same thing. They're going to hate you because you are too happy. You too successful. You don't have any worries. What's the matter with you? All right, let's go on. So, <laughs> so God working his plan through fallen man. Wow, pretty heavy. Okay, so he says in verse 17, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up. See, I want to tell you, God raises up every leader, but the leader 
either turns out good or bad depending on the people. Who do you think put Hitler there? God raised up and had the office, listen, the office of that leader. But Satan filled it with Hitler. God has the office of America for godly men and women. But Satan's trying to fill it. You see? So the office is holy, but the person in it might not be. And that's how that happens. So God raised up a good Pharaoh, but then come the office of Pharaoh, somebody bad got in there. Hello? Sound familiar? Let's move right along, okay? So he says, for the purpose of the Israelites, I brought you up. Therefore, he had mercy on whom he wills, right? So who are we to question God? It'd be kind of like the clay saying to the potter, hey, make me this way. No, that would never happen, right? Make me this way. God, make me this way. God, I want this. I want that. Hello. We all come, used to do things. We don't do that now. All right, so look on. It came, verse 19 says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? God, remember, he, can't, he, he has fault with sin. For who has resisted his will? The Israelites. <laughs> But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to the one who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay? From the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. Here's a hard one. God brings the vessel up. Satan polluted that vessel. That clay got polluted. Sin nature got in our flesh. We choose God, and now we become a vessel of honor. We reject God, and now we're a vessel of dishonor, coming from that one type of clay. Can you say amen? The one original lump. <laughs> the one lump will do you there. Can you say amen? So now you're seeing it? He, he's relating to Jews here, really relating to him. So he says, now, does not the potter have power over the clay? Huh? One to honor, one to dishonor. Did you know it says, I'm, I'm sure it's in Timothy, it says that in the house of God, there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. And I used to scratch my head and say, what do you mean? There are those in the house of God that choose to follow God and there are those in the house of God that you choose to play games. Maybe they don't think they are playing games. I'm not trying to be mean. But they're thinking everything's cool by doing their own thing. One day we'll wake up. They're too old to make any changes. They'll stand before God and God will say, well, it's a big barbecue, but in or in, not going to be good. And one time I had a dream. Boy, that just sobered me up. That From that time, I started watching how I spoke, why I said things, started making it purposeful for what I tell you that I'm not lying. Why do people listen to you and try to interpret what you mean instead of just hearing what you say? That's a lie of the devil. If I say, you know, I really love you, but, you know, you got to work on this. No, I'm not saying I really hate you. <laughs> that's how Satan works and it'll come in your voice in your head well what he's really saying is you know you know and it happens so moving past that think about how the Israelites felt when they were in the flesh following their religions big phylacteries and shinings standing on street corners making big boastful prayers now, I love the Jewish people, but you find one that has faith in God is much different than one that's trying to please God by works. All right, so, all right, we came from one lump, didn't we? Next point, Romans 9, 22 through 29. You with me? What if God, wanting to show his wrath 
to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Boy, at one time, there was only eight that were even saved of the whole world. And that he might make known the riches of his glory to the vessels of mercy when he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Hello. We're all one lump. Well, how did the Jews come about, Pastor Kerry? Well, God needed to bring forth the Messiah. He had to get a bunch of people, Abraham being first, to become circumcised and sanctified unto God so that he could keep them from the pollution of the world as best as he could. That's why they were given certain diets of things to eat, certain things not to touch, not to intermarry, always for the purity of Christ coming forth from the seed of Abraham being born in Israel of the throne of David, of the seed of Abraham, the promise of, in the beginning, the seed of a woman. If that would have been lost, everything would have been lost. Hello. So God made a nation for that entire reason. Now the problem was the nation got full of themselves. Forgot why they were picked. Got more into their job than they did their responsibility. And when Jesus finally showed up, they crucified him. Wow. Sure want to follow people like that. No, I want to follow Christ. Amen? All right. So, he goes on. So, the wrath of God, the destruction. Okay? Even us, whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. Verse 25. As he said also in the house, in Hosea, excuse me, I will call them my people who were not my people. This is Hosea. And he and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where I was said to them, you are not my people there, but they shall be called sons of the living God now. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be this as a sand of the sea, only a remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short. That's the tribulation in righteousness. Because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Hello? Amen. Life is but a vapor. And then somebody sneeze and that's all she wrote <laughs> are you with me then in Isaiah said again unless the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed Jesus he would have we have been come we would have become like Sodom and would have been made like Gomorrah so isn't that Romans 1 people without God if we would never had Christ as an example the law would have killed us and we would become like Sodom and Gomorrah. That corrupted. Well, that's pretty heavy. So point one, two, three, and four. God was long-suffering concerning mankind. Can I have an amen? amen? He had to work the covenants in, didn't he? Two, he made the Jewish nation to bring forth his son and save all who call on him, Jews and Gentiles. Point three, so when a person asks God to forgive them, and come into their heart, there is no difference anymore. They become born again into Christ and accepted by God. Fourthly, Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, our Messiah, made a way where there was no way, paid the price for all, and then those who choose him get introduced to Jesus Christ, and we get to walk with them. Can you say amen? Finally, the last scriptures. Romans 9, 30 through 33. What shall we say then? Paul was always good at that, wasn't he? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness 
have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by what? Faith. But it, it were by the works of the law. Remember when we approach God, we approach him by faith, not works. And it's the Canaan. Amen. Amen. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion. No, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And whosoever believes on him will be not put to shame. So I gave you a couple of quick scriptures. These are ones that we can study out when you take it home if you want. But underneath that, a couple of points. And then we got uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8. So I us hope I have time to read it. We'll see. Okay. And it says, point one, the Gentile who pursued God obtained righteousness. How did they do it? By faith. The Jews who had the law of righteousness, it was a righteous law, could not attain righteousness because they received it not by faith, right? Mm -hmm. Never forget Cain and Abel, the works of the law is not received by faith. Faith is. Faith in God puts you in God's family. Not your efforts, not you trying to be perfect. Hello, don't try to impress man. Don't be a man pleaser. I'd rather be a God pleaser. I don't want to be a man pleaser. All right, so Ephesians says that the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. Now you know who he's talking about. Okay, either obey God or you're going to have some wrath. And then 2, 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8, Therefore I also contain it as in Scripture, Behold, I lay at Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him may in no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he's precious. But to those who are disobedient, that's the Jewish people, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief of the cornerstone. The one they rejected, God brags on. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They that stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. So God appointed them. If you're going to disobey my word, then there's no grace. You'll just stumble around till you're tired. <laughs> and many of them didn't get through the wilderness. Well, if you got something out of that tonight, will you give the Lord a praise? Sorry about the mic going out.